until you have touched the East End Crescent and bless them. Anything you touch is blessed. them at least, you know, and so let's put our hands together and give the Lord a round of applause for the ministry, and we declare increase in your life in the name of Jesus. They made the worship much easier for me. Was it that for you as well? Yes. It was so much easier for me. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Last week we looked at who's battling. Who's battling. Very good. We looked at who's battle it is. This day we want to look at Whose devil it is? We want to look at whose devil it is. You know, and we want to lay a foundation. I'm pretty sure that we'll only be able to lay a foundation today. We may not even get to the point where we fully recognize, but we want to lay at least a foundation, and then we pick it up on Friday night. Amen? Amen. 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 And so, we have a few things that we want to deal with this morning, so... And there's a tighten your seatbelt, right? So it is important to know, last week we learned that the fight is on, right? So we know there's a battle, we know the battle belongs to the Lord, and we realize that we were also called out to be active participants in this battle, right? Yes. And so it is absolutely important to have a knowledge of the opponent. It's absolutely important to have good knowledge of the opponent. And I want to ask you today, do you know the enemy? Answer is a question. Do you know the enemy? Okay, Auntie gave a very good answer. She said, somewhat. That's a very secure answer. Do you know the enemy? If you were to see him, could you identify him? Pause and think about that. If you were, because we remember, we're in a battle, and we at least need to know who we're fighting. Because if we don't know who we're fighting, we may end up fighting those we're not supposed to fight. Yes. Do we realize that? Yes. I'm pretty sure that must have been the confusion that happened to the Moabites last week. They weren't so sure who they were fighting. They turned on themselves. And so we must know. So let me ask you again. If you were to see the enemy, could you identify him? And I want to start with the children because they normally... You know, they are more honest. They won't pretty up the stories to tell us. So if you were to identify, where's Ethan? I like Ethan's mind. If you were to identify the enemy, Ethan, how would you look? What, what would you look for to know that's the enemy? Okay. What would you look for, Jakeem? Leave him, that's very good. 
good. Yes. Very good. Because guess what? In some of our adult lives, yes. we're looking for that too. But we're ashamed to say it. That's why I call it the children to just relieve us of that, you know? That that, that secret thing. Yes. It's true. Yes. Yes. The fork, yes, we're looking for the fork and what else? What else to look for? The horns. Yes, to look for the horns. No, it's very, very serious, you know, that we begin to identify because that's what we will look for. So, <laughs> we'll, we'll pick that up a little later, that whole story as to, you know, what we look for. But from our interactions with, with sports and activities, we have learned that it is very important to have a knowledge of the enemy of the opponent right the enemy it's very vital that we know so if you watch basketball football anything and you're really into it if you want to do the curve like you're saying you want your athlete to be you will have to watch that video several times you'll have to watch to see what happens right and so we realize that everybody recognizes it's important to have some knowledge of the opponent so coaches they they diligently study when the, the, the person they're going to play, how they play others, right? They see how they play other games because they want the edge of knowing how the competitor plays. And do you think it's the same in our battle as well? Yes, it is the same in our battle. So if we dare engage the, the adversary in spiritual warfare, we should learn some important things about it because he is dangerous. We have already learned that, right? So we understand that he is pretty dangerous. And 2 Corinthians um, 2 and verse 11 reminds us of this. It says, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are ignorant of his devices. Right? And if we remember that scripture, we probably can recall what was going on there. So Paul, the, this whole thing in Corinthians, Paul was writing to the guys because there was somebody who was caught into some sin, some immorality, this man. And the church did not want to accept him. You know, that's regular, right? So though he had repented, he was in a place of repentance, the church did not want to readily uh, restore him with brotherly love. And so Paul said to them, look here, be careful, because the enemy can take advantage of us, right, if we don't understand his strategy. So Paul, he had a knowledge of the enemy's operation, and we would understand that Paul would know that. He had, he had a very good knowledge. He knew very well, that the adversary is looking to take advantage of our mistakes as individuals and as church. Do we know that? Yes. Yes. So he, he, he reckoned that quickly and he, call, he cautioned the church that, look here man, let us deal with the issues that we're having. Let us deal with them like Christian because our opponent is not waiting. Right? So the term take advantage of suggests the idea of cheating someone out of something that belongs to them. To take advantage of? To cheat you out of something that belongs to you. When we are ignorant of Satan's strategy, he is able to take from us that which belongs to us in Jesus. Do we understand that? What are some of those things that he can take from us that belongs to us that God would have already paid the price and have given us and we need not work for? Things like our joy. What else? Our peace. Our uh healing. -huh. Our healing. Yes. Our fellowship. Our victory, our victory. If we can continue to feel defeated, then he's taking advantage of us. And so we must know his strategies so that we are not taken advantage of. For we are not ignorant. Paul goes on to say, we are not ignorant of his devices. The failure of the Corinthians church to show love to the repentant man could be used as a strategy of Satan. Yes, yes. Do we see that? That could be used as a strategy of Satan. So we are not ignorant of his design. The devices does not suggest that we automatically acquire knowledge of the devil at our conversion. Are we aware of that? Second Corinthians. Sorry about that. Second Corinthians two eleven. Right. And so we might just you know put a scant regards to the facts because we believe that it's automatic. Once you're converted, something is downloaded, genetically downloaded into you. And you have a very good understanding of whom it is that we're fighting. John 8 and verse 44. Jesus told the religious leaders of his days. He says, your father is the devil. devil. You belong to him. 
You want to do what he wants. He was a murderer from the beginning. He was, he was always against truth. There is no truth in him. He is like the lies he tells. The devil is a liar. He is the father of lies. He is what? The father of lies. So remember what we're talking about. We're talking about understanding our opponent. And we're building a foundation. Because in a Christian's bid to understand the opponent, we go into waters that's not for us. Right? And so we're pulling it back because we're perfect in our warfare. Now, I want us to talk a little bit. If Satan is a certified liar, according to John 8, 44, why should we pay attention to what he says about anything, even about himself? We know he's a liar. Why should we pay attention to what he says? The scripture says, he is like the lies he tells. And just in case we don't understand it, he is a liar. Something that it, 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 it fortifies it. He is a liar. And then to, to fortify that statement some more, he says, he is the father of lies. Can you imagine? So guess what? We don't need to read book on Satanism to learn something about the nature of Satan. We don't have to do Satanic stuff to understand the nature of Satan. Huh? We don't need to. He will take advantage of us. Are we seeing that? Yes. He will take advantage of us. So how do we acquire this knowledge that we need to have of the enemy? How do we acquire this knowledge? Exactly. By reading the scriptures. God's word gives us sufficient information about the devil. Do you believe that? Yes. And we're going to spend the time to look at some of them. If we put Isaiah 14 with, with Ezekiel 28 and we match that to Revelation 12, we will have a fairly comprehensive picture of Satan. And we need to look no place else. We don't need his dream books. We don't need anything else. We don't need the syrup. We don't need a thing else. The word is sufficient. Yes. Is it sufficient? Yes. Of course. Do you believe the word is sufficient? Yes. If we observe Ezekiel 28. 28. Isaiah 14. Ezekiel. Isaiah 14. Ezekiel 28. Revelation 12. If we pay attention to the prompting of the Holy Spirit, we will understand our opponent. Isn't that so? Yes, oftentimes it's the Holy Spirit that makes you aware that he's trying to work on you, that he's trying to get into your business, that he's trying to lead you astray. It's the Holy Spirit. So let us take, let's take, as, um, who's going to take Isaiah? Isaiah 14. Someone read Isaiah 14 for me. All of you? Read until I. For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob, and will yet choose Israel, and set them in their own land, and the strangers shall be joined with them, and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. And the people shall take them, and bring them to their place. And the house of Israel shall possess them in the land of the Lord for servant and hope and maid. And they shall take them captives, whose captives they were, and they shall rule over their opp oppressors. And it shall come to pass in the day that the Lord shall give thee rest from thy sorrow and from thy fear and from the hard bondage wherein thou wast made to serve, that thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, how hath the oppressor seized, the golden city seized? The Lord hath broken the staff of the wicked, and the scepter of the rulers. He who smote the, smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke, he that ruled the nation in anger, is persecuted and not hindered. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing, 
Yea, the fair trees rejoice at thee, and the cedars of Lebanon saying, Since thou art laid down, no feather is come up against us. Hell from beneath is moved from thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the death of thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It shall raise it shall raise up from their thrones of the kings, all the kings of the nations. All they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as us? Art thou become like unto us? Eleven. Go straight to fifteen. Yes. Yet though. I'm trying to read from eleven to fifteen. I just keep on going. Yes. No. no, eleven to fifteen. Oh. Right. Okay. Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy vials. The worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down from the ground, which this didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the side of the pit. Do you have a picture of him? Yes. Are you seeing what he looks like there? Yeah. He looks like what there? Yeah. Yes. And do, can, could you see pride? Yes. Just yes. walking yes. around like Incredible Hulk? Yes, just walk, yes. And you could see pride on parade. Mm. Let us see what Ezekiel says. Let's read from about verse 11. Or 10. Take it from verse 10. You will die like an outcast at the hands of the foreigners. I, the sovereign Lord, have spoken. Then this further message came to me from the Lord. Son of man, weep for the king of Tyre. Give him this message from the sovereign Lord. You are the perfection of wisdom and beauty. You are an Eden. The garden of God. Your clothing was adorned with every precious stone. Red carnelian, chrysolite, white moonstone, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald. All beautifully crafted for you and set in the finest gold. They were given to you on the day you were created. I ordained and anointed you as the mighty angelic guardian. You had access to the holy mountain of God and walked among the stones of fire. You were blameless in all you did from the day you were created until the day evil was with violence and you sinned. So I banished you from the mountain of God. I expelled you, O mighty guardian, from your place among the stones of fire. Your heart was filled with pride because of all your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth and exposed you to the curious gaze of kings. You defiled your sanctuaries with your many sins and your dishonest trade. So I brought fire from within you and it consumed you. I let it burn you to ashes on the, on the ground in the sight of all who are watching. All, you, all who knew you are appalled at your fate. You have come to a terrible end and you are no more. Amen. Thank you. So we're now at Revelation 12. We go from about, about verse 1. A great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. And she was with child, and she cried out, being in labor and in pain, to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads were seven diadems, and his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. 
and she gave birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God, so that there she would be nourished for 1,260 days. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war, and they were not strong enough. And there was no longer place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were down with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. He who accuses them before our God day and night. And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life even when faced with death. For this reason, rejoice. Rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, knowing that he has only a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was thrown down to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman so that she could fly into the wilderness to her place where she was nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. And the serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman so that he might cause her to be swept away with the flood. But the earth helped the woman and the earth opened its mouth and drank up the river which the dragon poured out of his mouth. So the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her children who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Thank you. Do we have some idea yes. that we can work with? And so what we want to establish is that the enemy's devices, they have not changed since the creation of man. Are we aware of that? Yes. His devices, they have not changed since the creation of man. We have gained much of our concept, as we realized earlier, from ancient mythologies and religious arts. And we are only able to recognize the forces evil when we see certain stuff, right? And we fail to realize that he is, that the enemy is the highest of all creations. Are we aware of that? So that the things that we're looking at, we won't recognize the enemy really. So quickly, he could disarm us. The regular stuff that we know to look for. We would look for those precious stones and stuff. If, if someone comes attired in those kinds of stuff, like the thing that on Auntie Ella's neck, you'd think she's fairly sensible, not true? But if they had banana trash around the neck, you'd laugh this morning because you know something is going on because of our perception and what it is that has been downloaded into us according to culture. So we therefore characterize the enemy as having horns, cloven hooves. Um, we, we, we talk about when we see tormented Christians, we know, okay, devil. We call that devil, not true. When we see somebody tormented, we say, that's the devil. If somebody behaves excessively evil, what do we say? That's the devil. We'll call them Satan by name, huh? What are you saying? to the word. We have to because somebody would intentionally set up those stuff to lead us off trail. And so we have to get back to where we need to get. Amen? Yes. So the thing is, the scripture did not picture Satan as vile as we conjure vileness to be. Did we realize that? Yes. He did not. So it means that we have to 
undo our thinking and our knowledge of whom we consider him to be. He, I want us to look at who he is. He is consistently a religious being who understands worship better than any mortal can. Yes. In our bid to see him with horns and forks and those things, we miss that. He is religious. The enemy is what? Religious. religious. And understand worship more than any mortals can. That is supposed to have our attention. Go back to the word we got on Friday night. What was the word? Worship does what? We do war. And we are in war. And if he understands it better than we can, then if we don't get ourselves together, we are in trouble. We're in trouble. We are going to um, wage inaccurate warfare. Yes, Auntie? I've just realized that that's the thing that, I mean, but that's the thing that he stopped doing, which is worship. All right. So we understand where the feelings, where it lies. Yes. Where the issue lies. Are we realizing? Yes. Where the issue lies. He was literally created. Yes. Literally created as a musical instrument, basically. Mm -hmm. And when the wind and the glory of God shone over him or passed him, he naturally produced worship to God. So just, just go back even to that information where he was so wired to produce and to give worship to God that when the elements came at him, what came out of him? When the elements come at us, what comes out of us? Frustration, angry, feelings to backslide. I want us to put ourselves in position in a because a lot of times we confront the enemy like we have what it takes. I mean, when the elements passed over him, he did what he was created to do. So can you imagine that he can have a field day laughing at us, eh? Yes. At our best. <laughs> our best shot at it. Go ahead, Pastor Vernon. But going up in church, church, foundation church, we always heard that he goes after the best. And his target is always the leader of the choir. All right, so we will put some flesh on that. Yes, auntie? There's a part of the Bible that says that when the enemy, like you said, the enemy strikes or the enemy is at you, you must dance and worship and laugh at the enemy. Laugh is All right. Are we getting started just to perfect our warfare? Yes. I'm, I'm, ex I'm enjoying this already. And I must tell you, I'm not preaching today. today. Last week was a preaching week, not this week. You know, so we're talking together. Yes. So, so let us talk again. So we realize that his position in heaven was near the throne of God. Do we realize that? Yes. Satan's position in heaven was near the throne of God with all the privileges and prestige and power that that provided. We're looking at understanding worship. That's the point we're trying to clarify. The dwelling place of Satan, we read it in the scriptures, where it said it was. The Eden of God. What does that mean? The Garden of God. Oh, come on. Let us not confuse that with the Garden of Eden that Adam had. The Garden of Eden Adam uh, had was just a scaled model of the Garden of Eden that, that Satan had access to. Yes. Do we get that? Yes. Yes. So, so let's look at Genesis. You don't have to turn there. I'll read it for you. Genesis 2 verse 8. But write it down for your reference. And I'll also make the notes available on my blog. So you can get it as well. So you can spend more time focusing. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. The Hebrew word translated here for planted literally means transplanted. Are we making the connection? Yes. So we are talking about this Eden of God that was up in the heavens and he came down and he planted. So he transplanted from there what was there to earth. Are we seeing that? Yes. Are we seeing that? Yes. Are we getting so they you don't always wonder how the enemy found the garden. You know, it never crossed your mind? Yeah. How he was so familiar with it. Yeah. He knew exactly the tree that they were not supposed to. I'm always wondering. That's where he was. He 
you understood it? Better than any mortal could have. You understand? So God brought, brought plants from the garden, from his garden to earth's garden, to earth's Eden. Do we get that? So we are talking about understanding worship. We are talking about understanding worship. And if the person, so we understand that the fight is for our worship. Are we realizing that? Yes. So that the theme is so prophetic. Perfecting our warfare in worship. It is such a prophetic theme. Yes. Because that's where we have had the issues. So this creature, he was able, let's look at, we're talking about, we're looking at him so we can understand ourselves, right? He was able to receive God's love, Right? And pass it on to the lower beings, the lower angels. And he was able to take their love and return it to God. It's big work that. It is what? Big work that. Is that big work? That is big, big work. Remember this point because we're going to see how this particular event becomes a focal point later on. Psalm Eight and verse 5 reminds us that we were created how? A little lower than angels. So remember we had this high ranking angel who was the bridge between the lower angels and God. Right? And we were created lower than those angels. We understand that? Are the children following me? You are understanding me some more? What's your not understanding? Where did I leave you? Come and sit beside Oh, Kurt. When you're a little closer, you'll hear a little better. Anybody else that marked in your understanding? Because you don't want to come sit beside Oh, Kurt. So, this particular psalm should help us to realize that we are no match for this highly exalted one. We are what? No match. For this highly exalted one. He is full of wisdom. And we, as the scripture reminds us, we only know in parts. Remember that scripture? He is full of wisdom. And we only know in in parts. parts. Otherwise, it'll be a long time. Huh? Oh my God, this is frightening. So, again I'll say, he understands worship better than we do. Do we concur? Yes. Here is what we have missed though. Satan is still far more interested in worship than in sin. This is what we have missed. We think that he's all ups about sin. No. That was never his issue. Worship has always been his issue. And he's far more interested in worship than in sin. That spins it a little bit again. He is more likely to be right here today than to be down in the ghetto where they're shooting people. You know that? Yes. He would rather be here than to be elsewhere in areas of iniquity. He would rather be in church. So this fallen angel has more interest in corrupting our worship. Do you see that? Yes. More interest in corrupting our worship than corrupting our morals. But he has more interest in, is Jackie here? More interest in corrupting our worship than corrupting our morals. We spend so much time on our morals. Ah. Believing that if we have our morals intact, then our worship will be intact. But you can just assess yourself and you know that that is rubbish. It does not work at all. Because guess what? We get so caught up in being moral junkies that worship becomes immoral to us. We're offended by giving him what he deserves. Giving God what God deserves. We be, it becomes an affront to us. It's it almost become like sin. Like somebody wants to push us more than you are able yes, to go. Yes, yes, yes. Have you seen that? Yes. I've seen it. Yes. I, 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 yes. I, 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 go ahead. I remember it was I think at a funeral at a certain church. And a lady was there praising the Lord and all of that. And the pastor practically said I wish I could contact me. 
Come and show them what's going. Yeah, yes. Yeah, worship. Yes. So. And and it must the show must go on. So we become moral junkies, you know, and we and, and we have lost the ability to worship God the way He wants it. How does He want it? John 4 tells us how he wants it. How does he want it? In spirit and in truth. And if we cannot do it in spirit and in truth, then we realize that we are having, we're just having a clubbing session for our life. We're just having a clubbing session for our lives. Because he wants it in spirit and in truth. Satan knows very well that if he can ever pervert our worship, we will corrupt our values. We will corrupt our morals. He doesn't need to work on our morals. We will do the job with that. All he, so he doesn't, the things that we underestimate him, we think that he's interested in the trivial things of our lives. So we spend so much time on the trivial matters of our lives. He is interested in the thing that he was created for. Worship. So if he can pervert our worship, then when we're not walking in spirit and in truth, we will corrupt our morals. And so we understand why the joke that says, Satan says, Christians blame him for everything when he's not even around. Because we do the things naturally, right? We understand that. Do we know that Satan is not omnipotent? Do we know he's not omnipresent? Do we know that? We need to know that. Satan is not omnipotent. He's not omnipresent. He's not everywhere at once. And he's not all powerful. That is only reserved for the Lord God Almighty. And as Christians, as believers, as worshippers, we must understand that. We must get that. So we will see that the devil does not make us sin. Sinning is a personal choice. Do we know that? Yes. He does not make us sin. It is a personal choice, Uncle Norris. Yes. We choose to. So we have the will of God, the will of the enemy, and our will. And there is the enemy's will, there is God's will, and our will. And we will what we will. We will what we will. So whether we're going to will God's will or will the devil's will, we will what we will. So sinning is a choice. Isaiah 53 verse 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. Who gone? We. What have we done? We have turned everyone to his own way. Did this how the enemy turn us and come and catch us in a net as we believe and have the fork juking us and lead us in a particular way? Nothing like that. We have gone our own way. The Bible also says that there is a path that seems right unto a man. But the end thereof is death or destruction or whatever your version says it is. So let us try to bring this home for today. It seems clear to me that Lucifer was made to serve God. Yes. Are you getting that? Yes. It seems very clear to me that he was made to serve God, not us. Yes. Do we get that revelation? Right. He was made to serve God, not us. He takes authority, he takes instructions from God, not us. Are we getting anything out of this kind of warfare yet? Yes. So when we get up and tell him what to do and where to go, he listens to us? Let me say that again. He was made to serve God, not us. He takes orders from God, the Almighty, not lowly men. And what is it that we've been doing all along? Failing at it. Failing at it. Go ahead. Yes, Nancy. Next thing on it, um, we believe that he takes instructions from us. We ourselves become kings and gods. Amen. We, be 
become its channels, actually. When we get into so much conversation and issues with him, we become its channels. Its channels and we we'll look at that tomorrow in prayer meeting. So if you want to hear that, you have to come to prayer meeting. We we'll look at that part. The prayer meeting tomorrow. Tomorrow Monday. We are aware that Satan is not in the realms of God. We are aware of that? Yes. He's no longer. We read it. You read it with your own voice. You saw it with your own eyes. And your own brain perceived it. Huh? So you read it. That he's no longer in, in the realms of God. And so we want to look back at Isaiah 14. That summarizes this event so well. Isaiah 14 says, O art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer. Where was this home? In, the, in Eden, the garden of God. And he has fallen, so he is no longer in the, the garden of God. Yes. He is no longer experiencing all the beauties of God. He is no longer there taking the, the honor, the praise, and the love of the Lord angels to God. And, and you know, he's no longer that middleman. He has lost all of that. He is no longer allowed onto those wonderful stones that Sister Micah spoke about. No, he's no longer allowed in those, in those places. The coolness, the holiness, the beauty of God. So the scripture continues to say, Ah, who is Lucifer, son of the morning. How, this sounds like children really taunting somebody else. They're mean children, huh? How art thou cut down to the ground? I mean, this is big dissonant. Remember where he was? Next to God's throne. And you're cast down to the ground. So the scripture here is really, can you just imagine how he gets upset, huh? So we use the word. When he comes against you, what should you use? The word. The word. Remind him, oh, thou that art cast down to the earth. That would make better use of our strength and our breath. Our teeth and our tongue. Don't you think? And it continues. Which did us weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart. What he said? I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Are we, are we focusing on the things that he did? The so first thing, he had some desires. And the desires were to ascend into the heavens. What he wanted. Can anybody tell me what he wanted? What, what he wanted? Something. What he wanted? The very thing he wants now. What he wanted? Worship. How are you getting it? So he wanted worship. He wanted worship. He was not okay just being the deliverer of the worship. He didn't want to be the person that's delivering. He wanted to be the person that was at the recipient, receiving end. He wanted to be the recipient. My oh my God. So he, he strategized a plan. And he said, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Yes. I will sit upon the mountain of the congregation in the sides of the north. No, guys. We have always heard that. But why? Why would he want that particular place? Of all the places, why he wanted the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north? Let's check Psalm 48, verse 2. He says, Mount Zion is beautiful for situation. It is the joy of the whole earth. Could you see Satan's strategy from then? What was the strategy from them? To rob the joy, to control the joy of the, of the entire earth. Worship. Oh my God. It says Mount Zion is on the side of the north. is the city of the great king. As Pastor Vernon says, he goes for the best. Yes. He doesn't want the second best. He's heading for the best. So Lucifer desired to have control of the holy realm. Yeah. Yes, the church. In, 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 in service this morning, Pastor, look at Obadiah 1, 17. Did you see it? Yes. The Lord's people who escape will go to Mount Zion and it will be holy. Did you see that? Yes. So he wanted to rob us of that. Yes. He wanted to make there be no place 
for us when we escape his wrath. Yes. So his job is to find the church. Yes. Because he wants it back to his place. Indeed. Indeed. So Mount Zion is a reference to civil authority. Yes. Mount Zion is a reference to civil authority. Yes. And he, from the very, those long ago days, wanted control over that. You had your hand up? Yes. As you were speaking about... Um, that those for want to be and um, they receive inside. That's why the word I got said is better to give yes. than to receive. That was the word that came to me. Uh, yes. I was saying so it's better to give than to receive. Yes, indeed. Because that really does break down something in us. Yes. He continues to so point four. He had this thing real, real, real laid out to you know, I will ascend yeah. above the highest cloud and I will be at like the oh. most high. I can only think of the Rastafarians, you know? <laughs> I will be, I and I, have lived with the Rastafarian stepfather. And when he's ready to, to, you know, exalt himself like Satan is doing here, when he jumps up and flashes his lots and says, I and I, like the most I, and I trample, and I trample an or, or whatever he calls it, you know? And jump and say, I and I. So every time I hear, I will be, I can only hear the spirit of deception. You know, that, that strong spirit. So, Satan's strong lusting was to receive adulation of the angels for himself. That was the aim and purpose. To receive everything for himself rather than presenting it to God. I want us to pause for a moment. Because we will realize that this enemy that we fight is subtle. That this enemy that we have been warring against, it's highly possible that we may have him as our best friend and not being aware. Yes. True, true. I want us to realize that we may be working with him, working against God, in trying to get a part of the seat of the Most High, and we're not recognizing. I want us to recognize that. I want us to recognize that in our very best efforts, we may be carrying out his work. Than the work of the Almighty. I want us, even at this moment, to pause and to search our hearts. And if we find that there is anything there that we don't think that God deserves, because that's what it's about. He does not think that God alone deserves all of that kind of praise. God could not deserve all of that. Is there any place in our hearts today? Where we struggle to release everything to God because there could be no way that God could want or deserve all of that. You may not have said it in those words, but our actions over the years would have shown it. I want us to just humble ourselves and just repent. We don't want to wait until the end, but we'll miss some very important thing. Because that would have shown that Satan would have had a stranglehold on our heart. He would have been messing up our worship. What it is in our lives that we have set out, that we that is saying, I will ascend above the highest cloud. I will be like the most high. I will sit also in the mount of the congregation. Oh my God, what kind of civil authority we are wresting from God for our own life. We don't want him to have. What kind of joy are we pursuing outside of God? What? We're perfect in our warfare. We're perfect in our worship. And so because he really wanted this, he started to rebel. And this rebellion caused him to be cast out of God's garden. God is not going to have it in his garden. He likes it his way. So let us not miss the attack of Satan on our worship. Don't miss that. Don't misappropriate the attack. 
Let us understand clearly what our worship is. In this church, we should not struggle because we know that our worship is not our singing. We know that our worship is our lifestyle. What attack has there been on your lifestyle that prevents you for, from living your life totally for God? Totally surrendered to Him. Where when the winds blow, you can create beautiful music for Him. Where we can be available to God. Because that's one of the places where we lose as kingdom people. We are not that accessible to the king of kings. I can remember when Vashti was not accessible to the king. She lost her place. Immediately. Remember that? Yes. She lost her place immediately. And so, we don't want to not be able to access the garden of God. We don't want to not know that is our worship that is being affected, our lifestyle. And when our lifestyle is affected, then all the things that comes out to the worship, our reading of the scriptures will be affected, our praying will be affected, our belief in God will be affected, our love for our fellow men will be affected, our love for the things of God will be affected, our love for wanting to love to do the things of God will be affected, our, our, what, what we spend our energies on will be affected. You know, I'm, I'm I'm, 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 I've been troubled for a number of days, Uncle Josiah, because I've seen Christians who are energized to do other stuff. Okay. Energized, Uncle Norris, to do absolutely energized to do other stuff that, that is not even here nor there for God. You understand? So let's let's lose our little assembly here. So let's say we come in for worship. And we understand what, what we do when we come to give to God the singing. So though singing does not define worship, it is an important process. Singing was in heaven. Music was in heaven. Shouting was in heaven. Crying out loud and adoring God was in heaven. But when we come to church, we laugh louder after church and outside. Then we can open up our mouth and say hallelujah. Every time we come into the presence of the Lord, it's like we are listening. You listen at your yard when they come to corporate worship. It's time to participate. Are we seeing that? Are we seeing that? Do you understand that tomorrow? When we come, so we're missing corporate worship. We're, we're, we're bringing our individuality to stand as an affront before God. When we come before God in corporate worship, individuality does not exist. So if it is shouting time, what time it is? Shouting time. If it is crying time, what time it is? If it's praying time, what time it is? Time. And when it's listening time, what time it is? Listening time. Listening time. It's listening time. Whatever time it is. So we move with the flow. When we are in our closet, we do it our way. Yes. We bless Pastor Vernon. He's off to minister at the church down the road. So we pray God's blessing. With them, just stretch your hands towards them. Hallelujah. Okay. Don't surprise me like that next time, Uncle Norris. I did not know. Okay. All right, let's get back. All right. So. Are we there to understand it is our worship that is under attack? Yes. Pastor Vincent from Sunday night, open up your mouth and receive the voice to sing and we we'll laugh at it. We wouldn't even try it. And I want us to look at how we exalt ourselves above the Most High. We wouldn't even try. We wouldn't even, you know, Auntie Lorraine, like, open up our mouth and try. 
you know, we just, oh, please. That, you know, I would just casually pass it by. We won't try. So God had, I want us to clean up some scriptures that we have in our mind. God had not fought the devil. Do you realize that? He would not have fought his creation. It would be an unmatched battle. It would be unfair, unreasonable for the creator of the ends of the earth to come to fight his creation. How would that look? This would give the atheists big things to talk about. It would give Satan power. Does it take? It took the creator to fight the creation. So God didn't get himself entangled into that. You know? What did he do? He, look, I want us to see the, pros the procession. Jakim, I want us to see. So remember, Satan was the highest being that was created. So he was the highest of all angels. And God drew from the bottom line and drew an angel that was of lower rank than Satan and put him against him. I wonder if we saw that. So he drew Michael and Michael's angels. Michael served below Satan in heaven at the time. And he drew, so look at God on show. That's why he tells us enough. The battle is not ours. He is the divine strategist. Because he knows the finished work. He knows the outcome. So he drew Michael and Michael's angel to fight against the dragon and the dragon's angels. No one remembers that the dragon was bad. Remember, you read it when he moves his tail? How much stars in heaven came out just by his tail just moving around? And the lower angel gave him a flogging of a lifetime. That is our warfare. That's how we fight him. We remind him. That's what Habakkuk said. We'll come back, bring back the word. He'll come to trouble and say, Michael, because he must spread a Michael every day. He's terribly afraid. Of Michael. Michael walked him then. And Michael would have been in training to walk him again if they needs me. Woo! Did you see that? Michael. And so Michael and his angel fought against the dragon. And what your Bible says. And defeated him. He was defeated. He was what? Defeated. And Michael, I like this you know. God didn't even have anything else to do with the, the dragon, you know. Who threw him out of heaven? Michael. We always talk about God throw Satan out of heaven. Don't mix up God in them load of our kind of things there. Michael threw him and his angels out of heaven. Can you imagine? Man, I read Michael some more. And Michael was able to do that. Because he was armed with the spoken word of God. He did just what God told him to do. He was armed with the spoken word of God. We have biblical proof about only two things, that only two changes that were made with this person that we're, with this creature that we're trying to, to understand. Two things. God changed Lucifer's name. Lucifer was his name in heaven. Right? And that name was changed. Are we all on the same page? Yes. So according to Revelation 12, 9, it refers to him as devil. He's also called dragon. He's also called Satan. And he's also called the deceiver. Right? So his name was changed. And these names, they became so clear and apparent to us. I'm, I'm, I'm believing, this is my belief, that the names were changed to help us to identify his nature. Because yes. Lucifer doesn't tell us much. But when you hear about deceiver, you know exactly what the nature of a deceiver is. When you hear about devil and dragon, you know exactly what those are. So these names, actually, every time we call them, help us to understand the nature of his work against us. Change number two was Lucifer's position. The accuser. The accuser of the brethren. Right? So, he was, he was, what was changed? His position. He no longer resided in God's garden. His only access to heaven was seen in Revelation 12.10. 
where he was only allowed into heaven to do one work. And what does that work? To accuse the brethren. To accuse the brethren. An accuser of the brethren. Some things, however, did not change. Remember, said only two things changed. He still wants his throne higher than the throne of God. Are we realizing that? He still desires to replace God. He is still religious and desires praise and worship. His goal on earth is far less the destruction of mankind than it is to receive worship from them. So even our evangelism strategy has got to change. Even what we weep over and cry over has got to change as we perfect our warfare when we understand what the enemy is after. Because the truth is, he is after what God is after. So there's no way, as kingdom people of Jasset, we can be functioning as kingdom people even worse, in a worse place than the enemy. Because we must know that there are kingdom people who are not after what God is after. God is after souls. The devil is after souls. Christians are okay. They're after their career. They're after six figure in their bank accounts. God is after souls. We can only go after souls if it fits into our journey to the six digits in the bank account or the career. Or getting married or having children. Or, you know, flying the world. So we would pin souls to that. Our lives doesn't revolve around souls and then anything else. Whilst I'm winning souls will come in. We fix our lives and then see how winning souls will come in. So do we realize that we are not, we are, as we said before, if we continue in the same vein, we will be no match for Satan. Even up with even up, as my mother would say, to even call up his name in our affairs. Do we see that? He will be more interested until Lorraine in those who are willing to die for a soul than those who are willing to do something else and then so next. Are we understanding it? We're talking guys about perfecting our warfare in worship. Soul winning is a part of our worship. Huh? Soul winning is a part of our worship. Do we know that being an active part of the congregation of the, of the believers is a part of our worship? Do we know that? No, you're not answering like you yes, know. Yes, yes. Do we know that? Yes, sir. Do you know that, Roman? Yes. We all have a role to play. When? No. No. When? No. Now, I found something strange. I can use Shante in, in strange in worship. If you should ever come over here, guys, and see Shante on a Wednesday, or if Jamla should put on a show in Sablamar, and put Shante on the stage and you say, oh, Shante can dance. Have you ever seen Shante even give God a fragment like a breadcrumbs of that? No. Never. Never. Shaway, where Shaway? You can catch dance moves like crazy. We can just stop them and you catch them. And when you come to church, you call up and you're dead, you can't do a thing. Samoy? <laughs> you quickly understand my strategies and you'll rub the class from you, take it from you and build your seat in the most high place. And when you come to church, you can't hear, you can't see, you can't feel. No, I'm just, I'm just, you know, these children, they love Auntie Natasha. They won't be vexed. I won't talk to the adults. God sent me to Westminster for the children. I talk to the children. They can't help but love me because I'm going to do a thing. <laughs> you know? Amen. And so, guys, we have to be careful. I want us to assess ourselves. 
You, you want to start up saying empty? You more than anybody else know that only what you do for Christ will last. Do you realize that? Only what you do. I was thinking about it this week. And I'm like, my God, only what you do for Christ will last. And so guys, how are we going to fix that? I know we have had it bad. But I know that when we are enlightened, enlightened people make a change. Enlightened people make changes that will show that you have learned. That will show that you have been imparted to. How much longer are we going to continue to allow Lucifer to wind us into the world that we have no impact? How much longer are we going to allow the kingdom of darkness to parade like the kingdom of light? Guys, guess what? He was made on the spirit. We were made with spirit, soul, and body. And so he's after what he doesn't have in us. So he's going to infiltrate our souls. He's going to mess up our bodies until our spirits respond to him. Because he knows what's important to us. He knows that we're more important about how we look. And how we feel than where we will spend eternity. He knows that. Don't you know that he knows that, Auntie? He knows that. He knows that. And so guess what? He knows that we have challenges given into the kingdom. Because if we give our finances into the kingdom unto Lorraine, the kingdom will be powerful. And so what he does, he watches us and he sees that we're um, Titus and he holds us. You know who Titus is? Long pocket people. Your pockets are long, your skirts are short, you can't bend down to pick out what's in it, you're going to be exposed. So you have to keep standing and leave the money in the pocket. So we become Titus in the house of the Lord. And the enemy said, very good. Good job. And he gave you reasons. He did a wonderful thing unto Carlene. And then guess what he does afterwards? Just hit the flesh with something. And that same money that we could not bend down to take, we'll take 50,000, 100,000, 45,000, 2,000, any amount of thousand that was too good to go in the offering plate to go and do the test and to go and get the medication and to go and do this. And that money will never get into the offering plate so that we can build the kingdom of God. We think that building the kingdom of God is on the mouth. Just talk, 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 talk. It's going to take over everything. You understand, Michael? It's going to take over everything. Soul saving costs everything. It costs your money. It costs your time. It costs your tears. It costs your prayer. It costs you your meals. It costs you your dreams. Thank you for putting that in. It will cost you your dreams. It will what? Cost you your dreams. It will cost you your desires. We're talking about perfecting our warfare. Some of us not going to the supermarket with what we take to church for offering. Because we know it can't do nothing. We're not giving our children the offering money to go to school. We will never give our children a hundred dollars to go to school. The smallest of child getting five hundred. Not true. Not true, Uncle Desire? Yes. The smallest of child. But we bring that to the kingdom of the Lorraine because we're doing what? And one of my good friends used to say, he's what? I'm emptying out hell and filling up heaven. How are we going to do that? How are we going to do that? If we're to go somewhere, let's have go down to Sam to go pray. If we get Mr. Sample's bus to move from here to Sam is $20,000. We know that? Where, where, where the church is going to get that money from? I never come out here. It's not in my message, you know, to talk about money, but that's where the spirit goes. And the enemy has for too long been our budget keeper. Been our what? Budget keeper. Go back and spend how much money that you have lost. Hold it away from the church. 
how much you have lost along the way. Go back and check. See how financially prosperous you have been in the last couple of months, in the last two years. I want you to check that powerhouse. I want you to check that. See what your finances have been in the last two years. How it looks like we have had big rats in our handbags, eating up the serial numbers of our monies. You understand, Auntie? Because we have had the wrong priority. We have had the wrong priority. I want us to look and know that we have had, I want you to look it up. Money has come into your hands. Money. Check it out. 